so excited to be invited to get to share God's word with you. Um, especially this, this day, this is the last Sunday of 2020. Like, woo, we almost made it, you know? I mean, man, this year, like, the last 51 months have been a trip, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's not there. But hey, we've got a great message for you this morning. Um, I'm super excited about it. It's just one verse. It's really, really easy. Um, and I believe it's going to be so timely for all of us. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. Great, you got it? Let's pray. <laughs> just kidding. I didn't mean that kind of timely. I know some of y'all are probably halfway to Olive Garden by the time I said that. But hey, what I mean is there's, there's so much depth in this verse. And I believe it's timely because 2020 has been a year of great testing. Each of us has been tested in one way or another. And God uses these tests of faith for our good. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effects, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When I was in school, tests were always used to uh, prepare us for some bigger, more important test or the next grade level. But tests always grew me, and God's doing the same thing in our lives. With so much struggle and hurt that 2020 has brought to millions of people, we're more united than ever. It just looks a little different than we expected. COVID-19 has ravaged families. Riots and protests have set cities ablaze. Politics and vain hope have left people exhausted and confused. This is the state of the world we are living in. This is the state of the world God has providentially planned for you, me, and every other Christian to exist during. But why? What do we each have that God has deemed necessary for the ministry of his kingdom to people during this moment in history? You were not born during the Dark Ages, the American Revolution, the First or Second World Wars. You are alive now for a distinct purpose. What will history say about Christians in 2021? How will the stories be told by our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren when they read about how the people of God responded to the hurt and pain of 2020? What will they say about how we responded to the evil of the day? This morning, I believe God wants each of us to see how he is using this year's many tests to prepare us for a mighty response that could sweep through this land to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring love. And it all begins with how we resist and respond to the evil that darkens these days. Will you fight for them? Will you fight for the weak, the wounded, the arrogant, the spiteful, the angry, the confused, the lost? When we read Paul's words, we cannot ignore two simple truths. There is good and there is evil in this world. And victory is our only option. Whether you like it or not, you are already in a battle between good and evil. And the only weapon we have to use is a life of love. Do not be overcome by evil. And overcome evil with good. These are commandments, not just nice to knows. And since Paul felt it necessary to pen these words into his letter, it stands to reason that some of us out here have been overcome with evil and it needs to stop. And since Paul felt it necessary to inform us that evil must be overcome with good, it stands to reason that some of us out here just might be trying to overcome evil with something else, perhaps even more evil. But that's the common response, isn't it? But we are not a common people, are we? We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When we live within our high calling, imagine what could happen. Imagine if every Christian returned good for evil. What might change in the car ride home? What might change in your home, in your workplace, if you returned evil for good? Good for you all. What if it caught on? I dare say it might change the world and never be the same. Our first point this morning draws our focus to the first half of this verse. Do not be overcome by evil. 
As I said earlier, for Paul to write this implies that some of us need reminding that as followers of Jesus, we ought not be evil. Seems simple enough, right? But what's most concerning to me is that Paul wrote this sometime around 57, 58 AD. And if it was a problem for people back then, before Facebook and Twitter, how much more trouble are we in now? I mean, we can be plenty evil with five minutes of free time and a little keyboard at our fingertips. What's even more alarming is that we might not even realize how infatuated with evil we really are. Instead of calling this shady paramour by its true name, we have cute pet names for it. Little niceties, euphemisms. Things like, oh, it's just a joke. I was just kidding. Or come on, it's not a big deal. Or they deserve it. We can use words like weapons when we ought to let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only what is good for building up that it may give grace to all who hear. Our culture doesn't want us to act like that. In fact, we are conditioned to think that getting revenge or even getting even with someone is the appropriate response to being slighted. There's a song, uh, I'm going to have some lyrics behind me. See if any of y'all remember this song. I'll sing it for y'all. And I dug my key, and I'm just, I'm just kidding, I can't do it. I'll let, I'll let Randy stick to this thing for our church. It's Carrie Underwood. It's the song Before He Cheats. It's a great song. Man, this came out in 2007. I think I was a sophomore in high school. I was like, all right, never going to cheat on Carrie Underwood. As if me and my bowl could even have a chance. It's funny because you, you read that song and you think, man, that guy really is the worst for cheating on her. And he, he kind of had it. He kind of deserved it. He had it coming. You know, there's a, a recent study that came out of Ohio State University where they examined several hundred students. Um, they asked them to read one of three stories. And every story began the same. Uh, the main character had $50 stolen from him by this, this thief. And in the first story, the thief was forgiven. Um, the man even bought him coffee. So, forgiveness. In the second story, the man who had the money stolen from him found, who found the thief and stole $50 from him. So, an equitable retribution. And in the third story, the man found the guy, found the thief, stole $50 from him, and then got him fired from his job. So, maybe, maybe over-retribution. And so, the students, each participant read different stories, and they were asked to uh, share which one did they like the most. And they even timed their responses. And it was an astounding result that the equitable retribution was the most commonly uh, admired result to the end of the story. Saying, yeah, they, he should get what he had. Like, he deserved it. That's the punishment he should get. Forgiveness was less so, and over-retribution also less so. People were very quick to recognize the punishment needs to fit the crime. And we, we clearly see that in the majority of our entertainment as well. I mean, it's hard for me to think of a single action movie where the hero or the good guy isn't also committing tons of crimes and killing people to get to the bad guy. Like, I love the James Bond movies, but, like, the dude would be, like, holding one dude as a body shield while he shoots ten other guys and throws a grenade on some other dude. And I'm like, bro, you just killed, like, 50 guys. Like, I know they're evil and stuff, but they got, like, families, you know? Like, maybe this is just their nine to five. Maybe they're just kind of, you know, this is a side thing for them. You know, they didn't really expect to meet you. But we're, like, we're okay with it for some reason because his name's on the movie. <laughs> when evil influences us to respond with more evil, we are overcome. It's reminiscent of an insight from a staunch critic of Christianity, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, in his book Beyond Good and Evil. Nietzsche makes an argument against Christians who seek to root out the evil in the world. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not also become a monster. His context is that Christians are largely hypocrites in their fight to end evil since often they succumb to the very same evil that they cry out against. But surely someone will say, well, that's just natural, that's normal, that's typical to respond to injury with a desire to maybe get even or avenge yourself. The pastor Charles Spurgeon has a great lesson for us here. But to which part of us is it natural? Think for a minute. Is it natural to the new created spirit which dwells in believers? Or is it natural to us because there is a part of us which is animal? Is it the new man in us which suggests revenge? 
Or is it the flesh, the mere animal in us, which strikes out to avenge itself? You know, there's a story of a lady. She goes to the doctor, and the doctor's examining her, and he gets this really serious look on her face. She's like, you know, what is it? The doctor looks at her and says, you have rabies. Immediately, the woman grabs a pen and a paper and starts making a list. The doctor says, what are you doing? Are you, are you writing out a new will? She says, no. I'm making a list of all the people I'm going to bite. Why are we like this? You know, there's a saying, to return evil for good, that is devilish. To return evil for evil, that is human. To return good for evil, that is divine. Which of the three do you think God expects from his people? Almost nothing about the Christian life follows the norms of this world. We are called out of darkness into light and have been shown great mercy. How can we not expect more from ourselves who love and know Jesus than those who are yet to even call him Lord? If any should think that he will never be wronged in this life without making the other person pay for it, then what need do you have for grace? What need do you have to pray to God for guidance? Just wake up tomorrow morning, go find that guy who messed with you and punch him in the mouth. And make sure you also ignore everything in the Bible about turning the other cheek. Grace, forgiving each other 70 times, seven times, it will only hinder your ability to give in to the worst nature within you. But when might this course of action ever be appropriate? When has Jesus demonstrated an all-out revenge upon someone who wronged him? Or even consider life as a parent. Think what it might be like if you tried to get even with your children every single time they wronged you. I, I can't even imagine. That's, but nothing about that is loving. So why then is it often considered cowardly or weak to suffer the injury of another person and not retaliate? Men especially, have you not been taught to stand up for yourself? Make sure people know what you're made of. Maybe you even set up some kind of system that you will only tolerate so much disrespect until you give that person a piece of your mind. In my life, the men that have most impressed me were never the ones who were ready for a fight. Anyone can throw a punch. Instead, it was the men with the strongest resolve to bear more than I could ever imagine. Their strength was in their self-discipline, not their trigger finger. Consider then, who is your model of a man? If I asked you to describe the manliest man you can think of, would you be surprised if someone said Jesus? He is the height of masculinity, and we should remind ourselves that whatever is Christly is manly. Whatever you think to be manly, which is not Christ-like, is really unmanly. Throughout Jesus' life, we see a compassionate heart that adds good even when others would seek evil. When the Samaritans would not welcome Jesus into town, his disciple John asks, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Jesus says no and reminds us that the Son has come to seek and save the lost. And when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, courageous Peter draws his sword, cutting off the ear of another man in the process against this, you know, legion of, of the soldiers, right? All these soldiers who come. And Jesus rebukes him as well and then proceeds to heal the man's ear. In both situations and countless more, Jesus continues to add more good when he is faced with evil. We will never be able to fight for people if we are distracted fighting against people. Who has ever confronted evil with more evil only to find more good? Who sees their neighbor's house on fire then rushes to pump gasoline onto the burning roof as though that was going to help? If fire added to more fire doesn't work, why would more evil in response to evil work? If we allow ourselves to become the evil our Jesus died to save us from, we have really done greater damage to ourselves than we ever could have to the other person. Do not be overcome by evil. 
In his life, Jesus blazed a trail he now calls us to explore. Give love for evil. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, it's probably going to hurt more than the momentary pleasure of vengeance. But you are not alone. There is grace sufficient for you to prevail. If Jesus, who buckled under the weight of the cross he carried for us, was given Simon to help him lift that cross and bear the burden, how much more then will God provide for you and me to fulfill our high calling? Instead of being overcome by evil, we must respond with love. We must react with more good. Second point here is, but overcome evil with good. Did anyone watch uh, some of those like really cheesy Christmas movies on Netflix or Hallmark? Oh my God, couple, yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome, love it. Me too, I love them so much. I've watched all the Christmas Princes on Netflix and uh, I watched the new Switch to Christmas. Last year, my favorite one was The Night Before Christmas. That's all the same girl in all of them, I think. Um, I mean, they're great, they're great movies. I, I love all of the, uh, the lovey-dovey happy ending stuff because I just, I just love seeing good triumph over evil. I love seeing good win out the day. So much so that if you ever come to my house, uh, I almost exclusively watch sitcoms and romantic comedies because I can't stand um, the ending not being happy and everything being perfect. So much so that I don't even watch, I always skip the first 10 minutes of the movie Up, can't do it. Um, I don't watch the end of Infinity War or the beginning of part two, Avengers, I can't do it. Everybody dies, I can't do it, can't do it. Something just feels right about good winning the day. It, it inspires us, you know. But of course, those are all just stories and mostly fictional ones at that. Reality of the world seems more bleak at times. Nice guys finish last, right? So should we claim that Paul is some naive idealist, um, good, beating out evil? Is this uh, just some Christian aphorism destined for the home decor aisle at Hobby Lobby? Far from it. This is the epitome of our battle plan. Here's Paul's fourfold strategy for overcoming evil with good. Here we go. Step one. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. This is the first and most important step. We are not pacifists ignoring the fight. Instead, we fight back, but we do so with weapons of blessing. There is a response demanded from us when choosing whether to curse or to bless someone, our response must be a blessing filled with intentionality that that person would turn from injustice and repent to God. You see, I'm totally in love with this idea. You know, often I catch myself imagining how God is able to multiply the effect of even the smallest acts of kindness in someone's life. This gets me even more excited thinking about the bigger things we can do in someone's life. Maybe you start with buying someone coffee, but imagine how much more God can do when you bless an adversary. They may kick, scream, and hurl insult and reproach your way, but when you do not pick up their sticks and stones and fling them back, I can assure you the weight of your blessing can make the greatest impression. And this is the point of everything, that our love for them would lead them toward repenting of their injustice and turning to God. The theologian F.F. F. Bruce shares a great insight with us here. The best way to destroy an enemy is to turn him into a friend. Step two, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. This next step is born from the necessity for us to be willing to care for everyone we meet. In order to accomplish this, we need to first not get the two switched up. Often, we might find it a little bit easier to rejoice when our enemy weeps and weep when our enemy rejoices. But remember, we are most concerned about this person's relationship with Jesus. If something has afflicted them, let us pray it does not hinder their progress towards salvation. If something has benefited them, let us pray it draws them closer to Jesus' love. There is a great joy to be found in this ministry if you can be willing to first let go of any resentment that you've bound to your heart. Step three, repay no one evil for evil. Paul reminds us to avoid anything that might lead us to be overcome by evil. Be encouraged that when you abdicate every opportunity to compound evil with the addition of your own, 
you have in fact protected yourself from it. Let it not be said that you poured more sin into this world. Remember, evil for evil just means more evil and runs contrary to the teachings of our Lord. We are the disciples of him who died for his enemies. Are you a Christian? Then you are the follower of one who died for his enemies. Are you not a Christian? Then you are being pursued by the one who died for his enemies, Jesus Christ. I love what John Piper's saying here. Step four, never avenge yourselves. One of my favorite stories is a classic written by Alexandre Dumas, the Count of Monte Cristo. The movie does end a little bit differently than the book. I like the movie too. Uh, But in the book, Edmund is wrongly sent to prison and spends years calculating his revenge and plotting against every single person that was involved in sending him to the the Chateau d'If. When he finally escapes, he spends even more time calculating, preparing, and setting up everything to go according to plan. By the end of it all, people's lives have been ruined. Some have committed suicide. And he begins to observe the volatility of his vengeance. It begins to harm people who are never even the original targets. That's how sin works. It will always spread wherever it can to whoever it can. Should you invite its presence into your home, none will be spared. Instead of avenging yourself for the wrongs, And injustices, invest your energy into trusting God. For he said, leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. See, Paul wrote these words to Christians scattered across Rome. Christians who could be arrested simply for being known as a Christian. And just a few years later, the Roman emperor Nero would implement some of the most heinous crimes of persecution against Christians who dared to not deny allegiance to Christ. Many were executed publicly. Countless more were killed by gladiators and mauled by animals for entertainment. And then he would pile the bodies of Christians and cover them in wax and light them on fire to be streetlights for the city. And Paul's encouragement to them, do not avenge yourselves. God's wrath will bring justice. In other words, if you will love your enemy, bless those who curse you, not return evil for evil, and not avenge yourselves, you will be the overcomer, the conqueror, the victor, no matter how your enemy responds. I recently got around to watching the movie Hacksaw Ridge for the first time. Um, If you're familiar with the movie, you know it follows the true story of a man named Desmond Doss during World War II. Uh, It's it's really a great story. If you don't want to watch the movie, it is pretty violent. Uh, You can just look it up online. Um, Essentially, he was a uh, a man who would not hold a gun. He didn't want to kill. He believed that God would not want him to kill anyone, and so he was labeled a conscientious objector. But he still supported the war, and he believed that as a medic— Instead of taking lives, he could save lives. And the movie centers around an event that earned Doss the Medal of Honor. The only conscientious objector to ever receive a Medal of Honor, actually. In the midst of extreme danger to himself, he rescued 75 wounded men from the battlefield and lowered them by rope 350 feet down the side of a cliff. He spent 12 hours alone in enemy territory dodging soldiers and bullets to rescue these injured men. When asked why he did it, Doss's response is alarmingly straightforward. They were my buddies. Some of the men had families. And they trust me. I didn't feel like I should value my life above my buddies, so I decided to stay with them and take care of as many of them as I could. I don't know how, I didn't know how I was going to do it. And there's this image from that movie that made such an impression on me. I wanted to share with all of you this morning. This is the moment portrayed in the film when Doss determines to save as many as he can. And he rushes back into the war zone. You see the, the fire and the smoke and the rubble. But notice he's carrying no weapons. He's armed with a conviction and a willingness to do whatever it takes to save as many as he can. 
when I first saw this, my, my actual watching the movie, I laughed. I was like, that's ridiculous. Who runs into that without a gun? Desmond entrusted his life to God, and the way he spent it in the course of those 12 hours is nothing short of remarkable. He fought evil with good, perhaps the highest good we can know. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. The enemy sought to kill these men with bullets. Doss fought back with a self-sacrificial love that saved them. Even in the darkest nights, the hardest battles, good can prevail. Will you fight for them? That's the question I want you to force yourself to answer this morning. Will you fight for them? The whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. When I see sin or evil in this world, it's just another reminder to me of that person's great need for Jesus. I want to be part of that team. I want to be part of the team that is adding more Jesus, more good into the world. There's already plenty of evil. They'll need me contributing more to it. It may be our natural state to be overcome with evil and allow ourselves to be influenced by the evil perpetrated against us, but this cannot be so any longer. It may be that we seek to avenge ourselves when faced with choosing to bless an adversary or retaliate, but this cannot be so any longer. Jesus had access to infinite power, majesty, and might. In a breath, he creates galaxies. In dust, he creates life. Yet, his preferred strategy for fighting the evil in this world was to be born as a baby. In one of the poorest places, in one of the poorest towns. Jesus models for us how to overcome evil with good. In, this, in his life, he could have snapped sinners out of existence. He could have argued circles around people, um, humiliating and exposing their, their iniquity to family and friends. Jesus could have withheld miracles and healing until people proved their worthiness. He could have been more capitalistic and, and sold his salvation at a profit. Or why not overthrow the oppressive Roman government with legions of angels? Instead, Jesus walked, rode a donkey, had no place to lay his head. He dined with the marginalized, prayed with the broken. Jesus was not scandalized by the prostitute. Jesus was not ashamed of the thief. His response to the evil in his day was to overcome it with good. You know, I would question its effectiveness if I had not also been a recipient of his good grace. Jesus never won me with persuasive words. He did not steal my heart from sin with his rod. He invited me with hope and grace enough to claim it for my own. If you're lost, if you're angry, if you're scared, hurt, confused, and worried, your name is on his list. You are wanted, you are loved, and he is calling you by name into incredible goodness of his love. If there be any evil in you, take heart. The doctor has not come for the healthy, but the sick. He has not called the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. Jesus is fighting for you now, even as I speak. Who knows if you have not come here this morning to be introduced to him for the first time? Who knows if you are not here this morning to be equipped for the next fight you have so that you can overcome someone's evil with your good because they need it? Will you fight for them? Satan has been conquered. The house, the strong man is tied up. We can plunder everything. We can take everything and everyone for Jesus. Will you fight for them? Will you follow our Lord Jesus into fire and flame, praying to save just one more? I pray your answer is yes. And I look forward to seeing you on the battlefield. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much. You're not ashamed of us. You're not, you're not embarrassed by our secrets. You don't come to us proud. You don't come to us subjecting us 
to great punishment. You come to us with grace. You come to us as a baby. You come to us on the cross. You come to us resurrected in majesty, knowing that we can trust you with anything, with everything. There is grace enough in your pinky, God, to give us everything we need that you've called us to. Lord, there is nothing that you've asked of us that you haven't already endured. Lord, as we say yes, as we strap on our boots, as we have that Bible, your word of God in our hand, Lord, we want to go and join the fight. There are people right now you're drawing to our attention, you're putting on our heart right now, who need to be overcome with your good. What is 2021 going to be like, God? I don't know, but I know who you are, and I know what you've done, and that gives me confidence to know what you will do. Lord, I want to be a part of it. Lord, let us be a part of it. Use Cornerstone to be a part of everything you do to see this world transformed for the glory of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.